Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, Ryan Conrad, Baron McKenzie, and Miranda Reck for a discussion of their anthology Between Certain Death and a Possible Future Queer Writing on Growing Up with the AIDS Crisis. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Especially now, it is through the support of authors and our beloved readers that we can continue to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for showing up for us week after week. For tonight's event, you will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask the speakers something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We will get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase copies of Between Certain Death and a Possible Future. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable it yourself. Simply locate the button marked Live Transcript on your display and click through all the options. And one final note, as you have probably experienced during virtual gatherings this last year, technical issues may come up. If any glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. Matilda is the author of three novels and a memoir and the editor of five celebrated nonfiction anthologies. For her memoir, The End of San Francisco, she was the recipient of a Lambda Literary Award in 2014, and her subsequent work has received acclaim from outlets including NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. Tonight, she joins contributors Ryan Conrad, Baron McKenzie, and Miranda Reck for a discussion of their latest anthology, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future a stirring and expansive collection of dispatches from the generation that came of age in the midst of the pandemic that Sarah Schulman, author of Let the Record Show, calls an exciting and important collection that reconvenes community and brings our hidden feelings and experiences of HIV again to light and to consciousness. Across the 36 personal essays that form this anthology, a specific generational story emerges, one that captures the experience of those of us who, in our earliest queer inklings, we're led to believe that desire and its manifestations intrinsically and inevitably led to death. Between certain death and a possible future welcomes a vast and variegated array of perspectives, experiences, and sorrows, offering crucial stories from this missing generation. We're so excited and honored to be hosting this event tonight. Without further ado, I'm now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Matilda. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's great to be here with you. Feel free to light up the chat as we're going on. It's great to see where people are joining us from. Any comments you have, just let's feel like we're in the room together, right? Um, so I'm here, of course, to introduce uh, the new anthology, Between Certain Death and a Possible Future. So this book, came about when I realized there was a missing generation in AIDS literature and cultural politics. Usually we hear about two generations. The first coming of age in the era of gay liberation and then watching entire circles of friends die of a mysterious illness as the government did nothing to intervene. And now we hear about younger people growing up with effective treatment and prevention available and unable to comprehend the magnitude of the loss. We're told that these two generations cannot possibly understand one another and thus remain alienated from both the past and the future. But there's another generation between these two, one that came of age in the midst of the epidemic with the belief that desire intrinsically led to death. 
and internalized this trauma as part of becoming queer. I am a part of this generation. We share experiences with both of the more commonly portrayed generations. Maybe we are a bridge between them. This is my sixth anthology. And with every new project, I always start with an open call for submissions that I circulate as widely as possible. So I can bring together the broadest range of perspectives. When I was writing the call for submissions this time, I was careful not to impose specific dates on the generational frame, because I knew this would vary depending on a wide variety of factors, including race, class, gender, religion, ethnicity, rural or urban experience, regional or national origin, HIV status, and access to treatment and prevention over time and in shifting contexts. I knew that any generational frame only offers a partial truth. So I didn't want to impose artificial boundaries. I wanted to put out the idea and see who responded. I originally thought of this anthology as including anyone who came of age sexually in the midst of the AIDS crisis before the advent of effective treatment. But one thing that happened as soon as I started reading the submissions was that the scope of the book expanded to include some people growing up well after the emergence of protease inhibitors, but still experiencing the feeling of growing up between certain death and a possible future. To me, an anthology is an intervention. My goal is not to create a definitive text, but to inspire more stories from even more angles, to facilitate even more conversations, to deepen the analysis, to complicate the narratives. As I was working on this anthology, I was flooded by my own memories. So many stories that I'd almost forgotten, hovering at the edge of my awareness. Like when I was 19 and I drove cross country to move to San Francisco. What I remember most from that drive was stopping in a rest area somewhere in the middle of the country where I'd never been, getting out of the car to throw out my trash. And while I was stretching, the rest stop attendant came out wearing orange rubber gloves that went up to his elbows. And he pulled my trash out of the garbage can and put it in a giant blue plastic bag that he immediately tied to dispose of elsewhere. You need to leave, he said, or I'm gonna call the cops. To be a 19 year old faggot at a rest area in so-called middle America in 1992 meant you were a threat. What if someone got AIDS from your trash? In San Francisco, I found the dykes and fags and gender bending weirdos and other outsider queers like myself. We needed one another to survive the world that told us we deserve to die. We broke down every day in every way, but we believed we were creating something else. We needed to believe in order to live. In San Francisco in the early 90s, AIDS was everywhere. And now I realize how much shutting off was required to exist in day-to-day -day experience. You couldn't express shock at everyone dying right in front of your eyes because shock felt like a form of cruelty. So you would act like everything might be okay, even when nothing was okay. You met some queen on the street and she was showing off her lesions in a campy way and then she was dead. You went to the beach with a group of people and some boy was flirting with you 
And then you were asking around about him. There was that look in his eyes and you wanted to see that look again, but he was dead. You slept with someone who you knew was positive and he wanted to make it romantic. So he lit candles around the bathtub before you got in together. And a few weeks or months went by and you wonder what happened to him, but he was dead. I didn't go to memorials because I felt like I didn't have a right to be there. I felt like I would be stealing other people's grief. And this is a generational story too. We were coming of age in the midst of all this death, but we felt like it was not ours to mourn. If there's one thing I want this anthology to do, it's to open up the possibilities for feeling, for feeling everything. Grief is not something you can steal. You can silence it, yes. And I think that's what our culture has done. Dominant culture, gay culture, queer and trans cultures. The grief has become internalized and the consequences have been devastating. Intimately, interpersonally, culturally, and communally. In this anthology, there are 36 essays from an expansive range of contributors. I could have included many more. Every time I read through the book, I find myself getting emotional in surprising places, even after the work has become so familiar. I can't predict what you will feel, but I can predict that you will feel. Maybe it'll be grief or rage or loss or laughter or longing or curiosity or inspiration or empathy or craving expansion or contraction, devastation or catharsis, connection or confusion, revelation or confirmation, or all of this at once. Let's talk about everything so we can feel everything. Let's feel it all. So our future remains possible. So thank you again for coming this evening. Let's have a round of virtual applause for everyone reading and for everyone here in the audience. Applause, applause. <laughs> um, and our first contributor reading this evening will be Baron McKenzie. Berend is an award-winning freelance playwright, writer, actor, and producer. His writing credits include Bloodbath at St. Paul's, Fashion Police, Meet the Months, and Jones Inn, as well as his two full-length plays, Get Off the Cross, Mary, and the critically acclaimed children's play, NGGRFG. Berend is currently part of the inaugural year of the Warner Media X Global Access Writers Academy and has been chosen as the 2021-2022 BIPOC Fellow for the prestigious Catalyst Theater Confluence Fellowship in Edmonton, Alberta. Please welcome Baron McKenzie. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the Harvard Bookstore for inviting me and congratulations to my uh, fellow contributors. Hockey Night in Canada, Edmonton, 1984. I am under age and working in the gay bars. Randy is a waiter. I am a busboy. Randy is bearded and into leather. I am small and effeminate. I am told I look like a girl. He has a laugh that fills the room and his eyes dance with mischief as he chases men around the bar. Randy is always having sex 
and I am jealous because it isn't ever with me. Randy gives me a key to his apartment, so I always have a place to go. He sleeps in and I clean up while watching soap operas and the Oprah Winfrey show. One day I hear Oprah talking about the gay cancer. Her guest is a man with purple marks on his face. You are going to die of that. I push the thought out of my head and take the dirty dishes to the sink. One day, Randy asked me to meet him at his favorite restaurant at four in the afternoon. He has to tell me something. He is drunk and has been crying. I have it, the cancer, the gay fucking cancer. As he speaks, I can see the same purple blemish on his temple that the guy on Oprah had. I reach across the table and grab his hands. He cries and drinks until he is falling out of his chair. I ask for the check and take him home. The next day he is up early. He is cheerful and resolute like nothing is wrong. I need you to take care of the cats. I'm going to travel. New York, San Fran, and Boston. I'm calling it my screw you tour. I'm going to fuck my way across America and give it to everyone that gave it to me. I am left alone in his apartment for a month. I am lonely and depressed. It all starts to sink in. He is going to die soon. I can hear it in his voice. Every time he calls me, he sounds weaker. I can feel the walls closing in on me. Everyone I know and care about is now getting sick. Randy phones me late one night, wasted. I'm coming home, I'm ready. I light candles in the bedroom and change the sheets on his bed. Randy looks so different from the man who left a month ago. He has lost most of his body fat and his face looks like a wooden puppet. The purple splotches are everywhere. I sit him on the edge of the bed and take his hand in mine. Sleep with me, have sex with me so I can die with you. His eyes flash with rage, spit flies out of his mouth as he screams inches from my face. You selfish fuck. You have everything going for you. Look at me, look at my face. I'm covered in fucking lesions. You are pristine and young and smart and beautiful. Where do you get off asking me to kill you? Get out, get out of my fucking house. He kicks me out of his apartment and refuses to see me again. I am bussing tables at the gay bar when one of Randy's fuck buddies tells me that he is dead. I am 16 years old. Vancouver, 1994. The lesions on my legs keep moving up. The sores cover my feet from the tips of my toes to just above my ankles and show no signs of stopping. I have nerve damage and my feet are hypersensitive to the touch. Even a bed sheet brushing against them makes me scream out in agony. The specialist says this is because the AIDS virus has nowhere to go, so it is settling in my extremities. Feet first, hands later. His main concern is to control the pain and stop the spread of the lesions. If he can't, they may have to consider amputation. I have been placed on a number of pain pills but have built up a resistance to them. Now I am on liquid morphine, which I can administer myself every four hours through a shunt in my arm. The doctors don't know about my addictions. Cocaine, alcohol, sleeping pills, anti-anxiety medications, Valium, morphine, Dilaudid, Neocitrin. My trips to the doctor are exhausting and I get in bed as soon as I arrive home. The ringing phone jolts me out of my sleep. I hear a tired voice on the other end. It's time. Tom is whispering. He doesn't wanna wake up Billy Boy's mom, dad, and brother who arrived yesterday. Billy Boy's family disowned him after he came out of the closet. They just showed up out of the blue when they heard he didn't have much time left. Tom is an angel who stepped in to help 
when Billy Boy needed care. They met in Edmonton and moved to Vancouver together when they were teenagers in the early 80s. Tom and I dated the same man at separate times. We became fast friends. If you want to say goodbye, now is the time. The doctor says he won't make it through the night. The guys will pick you up in about an hour. I hear noises in the background that sound like an animal moaning. Tom says he has to go and hangs up the phone. My pain right now is really bad and I have to get it under control before Sandy and the other guys pick me up. I hate taking this drug with me everywhere I go. So I load up a syringe with extra cc's of morphine and push it through the shunt. I pack a flap of leftover cocaine in case I need to take the edge off and I wait. I examine my bloodshot eyes in Billy Boy's bathroom mirror. I wipe the last remnants of cocaine off the tip of my nose. I look like shit. The familiar feeling of numbness mixed with stinging in my feet is starting to return, which means the last hit of morphine is wearing off. I should have brought some with me. Hopefully I won't be here too much longer. I open the bathroom door and I see three factions. In one corner of the living room, Billy Boy's family sits watching the hockey game. At the opposite end and squished into the dining room are 15 of his closest friends, ranging from my age to the respected old guard of our community, the gaggle of gays. In the middle of the living room, separating good and evil, lies Billy Boy, moaning on a hide bed We've been here for hours. The doctor said he would be dead soon, but Billy Boy is being stubborn as usual. Thank you so much for that great reading, Baron. Let's have a round of applause for Baron McKenzie. And I wanna remind people that anytime you have questions, feel free to throw them into the Q&A function. You can ask questions for me, for any of the contributors, anything you wanna know, feel free to ask us and there'll be some time at the end um, to chat with you. Um, our next contributor, Miranda Recht, lives and writes in an RV somewhere. Her work on the AIDS crisis has appeared in Saints and Sinners, Volume 15, and Day Without Art. Please welcome Miranda Recht. Hello. Hello. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to read from my piece. It's called Elders. I'm going to read a couple sections out of it. One. In 2010, I am 25 years old and working at a needle exchange upstate. The building out of which the program operates is squat, creaking with age on the right side of the tracks, but just barely. From the windows, which are marbled with layers of grime and masking tape, one can just make out the overpass that bisects the city and parses the poverty line even finer. Oh, I'm having, hold on one second. Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? I think I'm having some technical difficulties. Can someone, is that better? Better, better? Someone help me. <laughs> yeah, so if you just talk that loudest voice that you just used, Use that one the whole time. And then I think we can hear you. Because otherwise it's not it's not switching to you. Yeah. Okay. Does that is, sound? Is it, is it Go ahead. Is that yeah, so it's just, yeah, that's perfect. So if you, um, you feel free to just to start right at the beginning again so everyone doesn't miss anything. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your help. Sorry. Of course. Yes. All right. Perfect, yep, everything sounds good now. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, let me start again. Um, part one, in 2010, I am 25 years old and working at a needle exchange upstate. The building out of which the program operates is squat, creaking with age on the right side of the tracks, but just barely. 
from the windows, which are marbled with layers of brine and masking tape, one can just make out the overpass that bisects the city and parses the poverty line even finer. Here, I am one of a team of volunteers who admit clients, enter data, assemble safer injection kits, bag condoms, prepare grainy coffee and flimsy sandwiches, and offer an ear or a smile or a just another Tuesday attitude as circumstance prescribes. Administering the agency's rapid HIV screening, which both results in under an hour, is not among my responsibilities. When the clinic director takes me aside one afternoon to ask whether I would be interested in obtaining my certification, I politely, summarily refuse. <sighs> Where the popular imagination is concerned, you see AIDS has not been a terminal illness for over a decade. So one need only set foot in our lobby to understand how in many ways diagnosis still represents the same social death as ever. And to me anyways, AIDS will always mean the low frequency sadness that dwells at the heart of family get togethers, the snuffing of the light of an entire generation of artists, the fear that only ever shifts its object from one reviled community to the next. I do not have what it takes to look in a person's eyes and initiate them into the legacy of this virus. Despite the good that it inarguably does one to know, I do not have the strength to tell it. Two, before death sentence, became livable condition. My uncles were young, beautiful, promiscuous, gay artists living in New York City during the most lethal years of the plague. I was eight years old and it was autumn when they came upstate to die. I remember them as powerful but insubstantial figures, all Virginia slims and gaunt limbs and cheekbones presiding regal. Between ages eight and nine, I bore witness to my Catholic grandparents' shame disguised as love and to my mother ripping my little brother from my Uncle Larry's goodbye hug one Easter because they still don't know, they still don't know the words worried like a talisman during my parents' next big argument as we sat in the back seat infected by her fear. Like so many other details of their illness, their last days were shrouded from us. We were left only to imagine, told in the toxic lacunae of Catholicism, that what was happening was because of sex. It would not be until years later that we heard about the opportunistic infection that took hold of my uncle Larry's compromised immune system and carried him off in peals of agony into the blacked out night of American history. A strain of bacteria known only to affect smaller breeds of dog and seldom fatally of the months following the last of the funerals. I remember the refusal by the school administration to pray for the repose of my uncle's souls over the PA. The, the rumor started by an older boy on my bus and spread from class to class like contagion that I had it too the feeling of being ashamed, of being othered, of being queer. I also remember my third grade teacher, teacher's concern, which she shared during a conference with my parents that I had been traumatized. 
and I recalled a heavy feeling in my stomach, uncertain what the word meant, but sensing betrayal in it all the same when my mother flung it at me like a curse one night after dinner. But how can I be traumatized, I wondered in green felt tip marker on the page of my third grade diary. I barely even knew them. Three. For a few Christmases before my uncle Jimmy died and then for a few Christmases after, my brother, my cousin and I went to see him acting the part of an elf in a film stretched across the vaulted dome of our city's planetarium before moving to New York to follow his dream of becoming a Broadway actor. He had belonged to a local theater troupe and this role had been his first foray into stardom. Early in his illness, we sat with a smuggled box of jujubes and giggled between ourselves at how fast he looked up there in his green costume, how scant his resemblance to the man of skin and bones who had just recently moved upstate to live with our grandparents. The truth had not yet been given us to understand. The year of his death, I was able to recognize some of the other elves on the planetarium ceiling so the contrast between their candy cane painted faces as they smiled benignly down at their childish audience and those of my uncle's grieving friends as they sat in a circle on the floor of the theater where the wake was held was almost impossible to reconcile that he had been loved and dearly was the only obvious thing. Seeing my Uncle Jim stitched into time and tradition year after year, but growing no older, I remember coming to a sad sort of peace that I would now only ever know him through his creative work. There was a weight in this idea that was entirely novel, resembling nothing else in my experience, calling me to art. Four. At 33, recovering from sexual assault and visiting family in the South, I volunteer for one day at the only syringe exchange in the state. Its existence, I am told, is of questionable legality, yet here at the far end of an empty commercial plaza, sharing its parking lot with vendors of a more illicit commerce, it stands. The clinician's careworn expression as he greets me in the reception area is one that I recognize intimately and instantly as burnout. His fatigue seems a part of the gathering puddle of gray above the city and the drizzle now beginning to puff the storefront windows. Despite warnings of severe weather, six of us load the van with supplies and head out. The driver is eccentrically attired and is eccentrically attired and highly decorated, sporting a formidable collection of Narcan buttons to tally the overdoses that she has reversed in her long years of service. With the rain drumming strange rhythms onto the roof, she imparts some local lore about the neighborhood we are visiting, how its nickname, The Bluff, is said to be an imperfect acronym for better leave, you fucking fool. At this, the volunteer in the passenger seat lets out a mirthless laugh. The sky is rent by barbs of lightning when we pull up to the curb. In garbage bag rain slickers, we set up our table beneath a tattered awning and greet the clients who are already here waiting. We pass out condoms, needles, and food offered to share our meager shelter. 
I load the arms of a teenage couple with brown bags and watch them clamor, the rain now coming aslant over a chain link fence bearing a nice west back in sign. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for Miranda Rack. And now I'd like to welcome our next contributor, Ryan Conrad, is a queer activist, artist, and educator living in the Ottawa Valley. You can learn more about his work online at faggots.org. That's F-A-G-G-O-T-Z dot org. Please welcome Ryan Conrad. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Matilda. Thank you, Harvard. Thank you, uh, sorry, Harvard Bookstore, not Harvard. Uh, thanks, Boren. Thanks, Miranda. Um, and I'll just dive right in to keep the, keep the flow going. <clears throat> so uh, my piece is called Looking for Gaetan. Uh, Gaetan Degas died on my first birthday in 1984. He was the flamboyant, promiscuous Quebecois fag, erroneously described as the man who spread HIV throughout North America in Randy Schultz's disingenuous and sensationalized 1987 book titled, And the Band Played On. The patient zero theory promoted in his book has been debunked by researchers and activists alike, but as a young small town queer, coming of age in the markedly homophobic and pre slash proto internet 90s, I knew nothing of the critical response to Schultz, just that I was a fag, a fag was the worst thing a boy could be, and I was gonna die of AIDS, you know, God's punishment or something. As a young teen, I remembered seeing the made for TV movie version of a band and the band played on and feeling this inescapable sense of impending doom. I was raised in a family of six in a moderately conservative Irish Catholic enclave in Southern Rhode Island, home to the Naval Underwater Warfare Center where my father worked, a small Catholic university, Robert Barron's Gilded Age summer homes, and an international elite vacationing on their gaudy yachts and 12 meter sailing boats. I'm the youngest of four kids, the only boy, and disappointment of all disappointments, the gay one. My three older sisters had the unfortunate luck of having to attend Catholic school until it became financially untenable in the wake of the 80s Reagan recession and the early 90s banking and loan scandal. My gay ass was spared the Catholic school experience by the mere chance of being born last, but weekly mass and Sunday school were still compulsory while I lived under my parents' roof. Being born last in 1983, as opposed to first in 1974, like my oldest sister, also may have saved me from an early death. Protease inhibitors, the drugs that finally pushed HIV into hiding in the human body, they came out when I was 13 but kids in high school still regularly made jokes about fags dying of AIDS. As soon as I could manage it, I moved from my deeply alienating Irish Catholic hometown of 16,000 to a poor post-industrial French Catholic town of 35,000 people in central Maine to attend college. The prevailing conservative moralizing attitudes about sex, drugs, abortion, and homosexuality between the two places were parallel despite the more than 200 miles and class differences that separated them. I barely knew anything about queer culture and I never met an out gay man until I left home. As a post pubescent adolescent, I had consciously limited my exposure to anything queer to evade the perception that I too was gay, especially once my friend circle disintegrated after the realization that the mutual masturbation and sexual play that we in innocently engaged in as Boy Scouts had deeper meaning to the adults around us. As soon as our playful behavior had a name, it also had a history, a pathology, a stigma, and an associated disease. If we kept this up, we were going to lead unfulfilling lives and die of AIDS, like all the poor emaciated KS popped faggots that we occasionally saw in the nightly broadcast news. Oh, and go to hell. No one taught me anything about being queer until I was in my 20s. There were no gay straight alliances or P flags or queer inclusive sex education classes. There were no queer clubs or bars or bathhouses. There were no activist artists or subcultural scenes outside of urban centers 
where I could find my proverbial people. There was one sexuality themed course in college and I took it, but that was it. Thankfully, Emma Goldman, punk rock in the movies saved my life. Emma for writing with such eloquent and exacting rage against the violence of social controls and disenfranchising by design economic systems in a way that remained accessible to disaffected teenagers like me nearly a hundred years after it was penned. And punk rock for giving me a sense of what's possible through collective organizing and shared passions, but also for calling out the limitations. Punk also showed me that I didn't have to be a boring rainbow flag waving pink dollar consumer like the boys of Queer as Folk and Will and Grace. Instead, I could be a queer anti-capitalist punk, although the urban centers of queer punk culture, San Francisco, LA, Toronto, they were all places where I had never been and all the punks I knew were conspicuously straight. And finally, the movies for connecting me with the gay history I so desperately wanted to know but I couldn't find. When Netflix began its DVD by mail subscription service in the early 2000s, I devoured everything I could get my hands on. I was a film studies student of my own making, following a self-directed syllabus based on Netflix then expansive DVD catalog. The anonymity of the mail order system meant no longer interfacing with and outing yourself to potentially hostile cashiers at movie rental stores greater access to unrated and NC-17 queer films that Blockbuster Video refused to carry, and a selection of queer films far greater than any brick and mortar video rental store that I had ever encountered. Through Netflix and the painfully small video library at the college I attended, I watched queer film classics alongside a slew of queer AIDS movies on glitchy degraded VHS or DVD digital transfers. An early frost, Parting Glances, Longtime Companion, Tongues Untied, Common Threads, Silence Equals Death, The Living End, Philadelphia, Silver Lake Life, Totally Fucked Up, Blue, It's My Party, Love, Valor, Compassion, After Stonewall, Angels in America. Despite deficiencies in representation, constraints of genre, and other shortcomings, these movies were where my HIV AIDS and queer historical education took place, as there, were, there was nowhere else for me to start. The AIDS crisis has always been a crisis of representation, not just a medical or political crisis. And I'll stop there and pass the mic back over to Matilda. Thank you so much, Ryan. Let's have a round of applause for Ryan Conrad. And a round of applause again for everyone here this evening. Keep in mind that you can throw your questions into the Q&A function at any point. And now I'll ask everyone to come back and join me here on the virtual stage. <laughs> here we all are. Thank you, everyone. There's Rhode Island is in the house we see in the comments. Um, there also are a lot of people who have crossed the virtual border from Canada tonight. So that's pretty exciting. That's one of the great advantages of a virtual event. The world of no borders can at least exist momentarily. <laughs> um, so one thing I'm thinking about actually, and Ryan, you touched on this at the very end, is this question of representation. So I think each of you in your pieces in different ways, you know, you're talking about this, this crisis in a sense. So Baron, you're talking about the early years of the AIDS crisis and, you know, Oprah, you know, seeing, you know, the way that AIDS is represented on these talk shows. Um, Miranda, you're talking about the deaths of your uncles and the way the stigmatizing response of your school and family sort of um, creates its own sort of pathologized kind of representation. And then Ryan, you're talking about coming of age um, in Maine and Rhode Island and searching for uh, queers, period, but also representation of queer life um, over the years. And so I wonder if each of you want to talk about this question of representation. Go ahead, Baron. 
Uh, you guys, that was that was so moving. Both of your readings were amazing. Thank you. Um, well, I grew up in in northern Alberta, and I grew up in Edmonton, and I was like 16 living on the streets, and there were no people like me here. I mean, there, I was, I think there were two people of color that I knew that hung out at the roost and flashback. So I had no representation. I, the only representation that I truly had was that of the queer culture and the drag culture and being a part of, of something like that. But as far as uh, black, queer, uh, gay, HIV positive representation, there was nothing like that for me. Great. Does anyone else want to speak to that question? I can go. I was, I was giving Miranda the chance to jump in, but uh, um, go ahead. So, so I mean, just one of the the things I think about is the the sort of urban centrism or the urban centric narrative around HIV/AIDS histories, um, and uh, yeah, I guess I I, I mean. I, I, ooh, what do I want to say? I mean, I went to New York to find my people and I didn't find my people. Um, and the, the narrative is, you know, country folk or suburban folk, they moved to the city to be gay and then they all went home to die. Um, and I, I, know, I believe that, I know that's true, but there's also people that never left. Um, and and I'm, I'm really curious about um, the people that didn't occupy the cultural imagination of queer people, like that weren't in San Francisco, that weren't in LA, weren't in, um, Chicago or, or any other of the major sort of cosmopolitan centers. And so I've been really trying to think through what it has meant to learn an urban narrative of what HIV and AIDS histories have been and trying to think through and step back and be like, okay, I'm actually not from those places. Um, and and what, does, what does HIV, what does the crisis in the past and present look like in the places I'm actually from? Um, and, and that's been a lot of hard work uh, to, to actually be able to engage with those histories because they're, they're often not represented or included um, for a myriad of structural reasons. It's no one's individual fault, <laughs> just to be clear. But I, I am interested in that question of representation. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Mar Miranda? Oh yeah, totally. Well, I see there's some questions jumping out in the chat. Let me just grab them. They're a little harder to reach. Let's see. Um, so oh, here's a question building on the question on the same vein of representation. How do you all feel that conservative political commentary impacts general attitudes towards HIV and AIDS during the between period versus now? Do you feel that negative representation still has the, and I have to scroll down, wait, my, my computer is not scrolling. Tell me someone, what does the rest of the question say? Let's see. Um, it says, do you feel that negative representation still has the same bearing on public opinion today? Great. Um, does anyone wanna jump in on that question? Do you feel that negative representation still has the same bearing on public opinion today as it did uh, when we were growing up. Hmm. Oh, well, um, I, when I was, um, I worked at a um, syringe exchange in, um, in San Francisco and um, it's um, a pretty, uh, obviously a pretty liberal city as far as their policies go on harm reduction. Um, but at the time, um, when I was working there, there was a, a lady who had been there like decades before doing syringe exchange when it was illegal, um, when a conservative politics held some kind of sway. Um, and she, she spoke about pushing around um, a stroller with syringes to kind of, um, you know, this guerrilla sort of syringe exchange prior to, prior to what it is now. So I feel like it did have a negative influence even in a city as, as liberal and open I turned myself off for a second. But you know what's interesting, Miranda, is I think I might have met the child of that person in San Francisco because 
Yes, because someone came up to me um, in San Francisco. I mean, it could be a different person, of course, but mentioned that their mother had been part of a syringe exchange and had pushed around a stroller. So, <laughs> so it's possible. <laughs> so these are how our histories are intermingled. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add about that particular question? Great. Um, well, I see, let's see, there's a question in the Q&A, which is the easiest place, let me see. Oh, here's a question for me. Matilda, thank you so much for sharing this with all of us. Could you talk more about any submission you wish you could have included but couldn't? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Interesting. Um, well, so one thing that actually happened was that Black and Pink, uh, which is the prison abolition, prisoner support, queer uh, group, um, they reached out to me um, when I was circulating the call for submissions and asked if I wanted them to include it in their newsletter, uh, which circulates in prison. And of course, as most people know, um, prisoners generally don't have access to email, but they do have access to print publications. Um, and I said, oh my God, yes, absolutely, of course. And so I got 50 submissions, uh, five zero, 50 submissions from people in prison. And they were really wide range. You know, I mean, some of them were <laughs> like dating requests. Some of them were um, maybe not even like, uh, like there was someone who kept telling, they really wanted like, you know, some of them were just, you know, the people who were lonely and wanted to express themselves and found a way. and. Um, I would say that was maybe like 10 or 20 of them. And then some of them were um, actually straight people writing about their experiences of um, HIV and AIDS in prison, which wasn't exactly relevant for this particular book. Uh, but there were several, there's one that's in the book by Timothy Jones and Timothy is writing about, um, he's been in prison for the last uh, 35 years. And so he's in Florida um, and he, uh, Sarah converted in prison. And so his entire experience of HIV and AIDS takes place through the lens of the prison, right? And so he sees the shifting attitudes towards HIV and AIDS in prison and they don't necessarily reflect the realities of prison, right? So people see on TV like, oh, now AIDS you know, or HIV is a manageable condition and, you know, and you can take these pills, but are those pills available in prison? It depends where you are. You know, condoms aren't available in no prisons in the U.S. still, you know, and so, um, so he's sort of writing about these changing attitudes over time and in terms of his own life, of course, uh, within prison. And there are a couple of things that actually, you know, he talks about how medications are, were tested on prisoners um, he worked actually in the AIDS ward within prison um, in the 80s and, and early, uh, yeah, in the 80s and 90s and watched and cared for people who were dying. And he was like, it's basically just, you know, whoever, you know, the people who lived and who, people who died, it was just based on this kind of roulette in that certain sense. Um, but, but there were a couple other uh, pieces from prisoners that I did want to include. Um, but I couldn't because I couldn't get back in touch with them once they had sent me the submission. And, you know, while technically, you know, they were submitting for the book, um, you know, I, I of course was not gonna publish something without someone giving me their consent and also without editing it with them. Because for me, in terms of the book, a lot of the process is that editorial process and that going back and forth and, um, and so there was one in particular by someone um, who her story was like devastating, I mean, like devastating, you know, like her, um, if I can remember correctly, it's like her, I think her sister, um, Sarah converted when she was three because she was raped by her mother's lover. And, and so it was this really, really devastating um, history over intergenerational um, of a black queer woman who is now in prison. Um, and so, so that was one example. There was also a, a, a piece by a trans woman in prison 
who the piece was really, it was not developed, but I could tell that the perspective was really, you know, um, vibrant if I could have um, corresponded more. But as, as most people probably know, prison, you can write to people and write to people and write to people. And you never know if you don't hear back, like they might not have liked what I said, you know, it's possible. They might've said, oh, I don't want to be in this book. You know, she has edits. I don't think so, you know, which is totally fine. But it's also, of course, possible that they never got, you know, my correspondence. And, you know, like in some cases I would get something returned and it would say like, the stamp is too colorful, you know, um, or you used a red pen in your signature or, you know, so there are all these artificial limits. Um, so those are a few, I think I'm talking a little too long. Now I see all these questions emerging. So let's see these other questions. Um, I'm floored by the idea that desire equals death. There are not many North Americans who have experienced that. How does that experience color your current sexuality if it does? I'll start just briefly for myself since I, uh, that was my quote. Um, so I guess for me, I think everyone of like my generation, um, loosely speaking, and I'm thinking very broadly, you know, I think grew up believing that desire equals death, you know? And for me, that translated into just on a very basic physical level, you know, when I first started jerking off and I was like, I knew how HIV was transmitted. And so that's a generational story, right? So like the generation previous to me would not have known that, right? But I still thought, what if I die if I taste my cum, right? I might, I, I just don't know for sure. So I better not do that, right? And so that's just on that very mechanical or, or I guess um, personal level. Um, but I think also beyond that, I do think we're all living with that legacy of internalized trauma and also of, and the way that the silencing of that trauma has enacted its own kind of uh, violence in the ways that sexuality plays out as a kind of discarding, if that makes sense. Um, like where it's very trans transactional, not in the sense where something is actually given, like here, have some money, which is great, I'll take it. But in the sense of this person is not worthy of anything beyond this encounter. And I do think that is also a legacy of that same trauma. But I wonder if other people wanna to speak to that legacy of feeling like desire equals death. Yes, Baron. Um. When I uh, when I was came out of the closet, I think I, I was 15 when I moved to uh, Edmonton, and I lived on the streets as a woman. I was confused with uh, my identity, and I found the gay bars and was like, "I'm going to have connection. I'm going to have physical connection. I'm going to have sex with people." But I look like Nona Hendrix, so none of the gay guys that I knew wanted to have sex with Nona Hendrix. And so I had this shame about that. Then I had this desperation of just wanting someone to touch me, someone to love me. And the only times that I would have sexual intercourse was often through uh, a date rape scenario or people that misconstrued my sex, thought I was duping them. And so then when, when people started dying around me, like nobody was having sex. So it's only been in the last couple of, I'd say 22 years since I got sober that I've really had to deprogram myself from the shame of having sex and the shame of being HIV positive. But then you also have the shaming of dirty or clean, you know, the shame online. So it still, it all perpetuates, it's all the same thing. It all just feels really yucky. Mm, thank you for that great answer. Does anyone else want to speak to that particular question? Yes, Ryan. Yeah, I'll just quickly say I, I have a pretty large silence equals death tattoo on my chest. Um, so when you have sex with someone and you don't have your shirt on, <laughs> um, it leads to all sorts of conversations. And um, one of the things I would say is most disorienting about this tattoo is actually when I meet queers that are older than me that I am having sex with that like are like oh what's that and I have to make the decision 
about what to explain to them or not. Um, and when I say, oh, it's like an AIDS activist tattoo, um, it can go in many different directions. But the, for me, the most disorienting is older queers who don't know what it is. Um, that, so the, the generational frame is interesting because there's lots of people my age and older who actually <laughs> don't know what's going on. Um, so that's always interesting um, as well as, um, yeah, interacting with young people who also um, have a fear of AIDS because they don't know things, but also interacting with other pause people. Um, it's, a, it's a signifier or a signal to, to people about my politics around HIV and AIDS. So it impacts every facet of my sex life. Um, I mean, just being a fag and like, I always think of HIV every time I have sex, um, but also like I have this tattoo that makes it the conversation, um, which actually for me is, is liberating in a way because then you can just like have the fucking conversation and not have to worry or think about that. Um, so that's my, my world. Mm, that's great. And also that reversal of the generational experience, which I think is so much about that silencing, right? Even of the, 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 the act of slogan, silence equals death, right? The silence, that which Ted Kerr actually speaks to in the book, where he talks about the second silence, which is the silence, the first silence being the silence when uh, the AIDS crisis first emerged, and the second silence being the silence after we finally had effective treatments and we're told, oh, now we don't have to talk about that anymore. And um, did you have something you wanted to add, Miranda? Oh, no, I was just trying to not Oh, yeah, totally. That's great. So I see, let's see. So someone actually is echoing the same. This is great. I'll just read it, but we already answered it. Uh, the fear that desire led to death being internalized um, by a generation about that generation's grief being silenced and how this has consequences for interpersonal and communal relationships. I'm wondering if you and other panelists might elaborate this. So that we've done, which is perfect. And, and I also wanted to speak actually just to that, just to amplify it a little bit, what Baron was saying about femphobia, right? And how femphobia intersects, intersects with AIDS phobia, especially in the sense of like the ways in which, you know, gay, you know, so-called community decided that oh, well, we're not, you know, those sissies, we're not those diseased fags. We're this other like shiny, happy, proud, like, you know, military bombing the world into a submission, you know, type of sort of methodology, which I think is also very relevant to this legacy. Um, so here's a question. You've probably gotten this question before. They're saying, so apologies, okay. Uh, oh, this is for me. But what was it like to be working on a collection about one epidemic while in the midst of another? <laughs> well, that was interesting and surprise. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because, you know, the call for submissions went out. Um, the deadline was right as uh, this new pandemic was emerging. And so some of the pieces, including Barron's actually, um, uh, go to that point, right? So I think, I don't know, uh, I'm just gonna speak briefly since I know we have a few more questions, but I will say, um, what was it like? I think it was, it's interesting because now we're so deep in this new pandemic that I can't even remember. <laughs> I'm like, oh wait, what was it like at first? I think at first, um, I guess I can speak to my own experience of the pandemic, which made me, you know, from going to maybe having 50% of the touch that I need in my life to having zero overnight, the way that that, that, that was very re-traumatizing in a sense. And also to seeing Anthony Fauci like lauded as this hero where H Anthony Fauci is one of the criminals of the you know, AIDS crisis, you know, and like, like in terms of the, the early years and yes, he came around in certain ways, but like, um, so that, that I think was maybe my most, the most direct connection. Um, but let me just look at some of these other questions since we just have a few minutes. Um, let's just see, I'm getting, oops, whoa. Um, okay, let's just go back to this Q and A. The Q and A function was blowing up on me. 
<laughs> okay, let's see. So let's see, Baron. thank you for your brilliant answer. I was struck by the way you related to the question of representation by addressing the lack thereof, the silence that many queer people meet when they're looking for contact. Could you talk about this book and the essays that compose it are, war are written into, against, and or toward this silence? Interesting. So that person wants to is asking whether you think this book and the essays that compose it are written into, against, and toward this silence. Do you want to respond to that, Baron? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm understand. Well, you have because I don't understand the question. Uh, can you can you elaborate? I think what they're asking is, do you think this book? And I mean, I can re ask respond to it, of course. Yeah. But do you do I think that do you think this book is responding? to this crisis of representation, the lack of representation. Oh yeah. I mean, look at the, the, the wide ranging amount of people that are, have been asked to be a part of this. I mean, it does speak to representation and you know, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. Um, well, let's see, I think we've gotten to all the questions. So let me just see, um, does anyone on the panel have anything else you want to just add before we come to a close? I was thinking about that smuggled box of jujubes, um, Emma Goldman and the elves all here with us. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything you want to add before we bring Benjamin back on? I want to thank you all for this amazing conversation and for being part of this book and everyone in the audience for being here tonight. Um, so maybe without further ado, I think we'll, oh, I should mention, of course, I see someone in the comments that this is a book tour. So there are some more events um, coming up. And the next one is next week. Um, it will be at the San Francisco Public Library on Wednesday. And then on Friday at um, Women and Children First in Chicago. You can, um, well, someone posted the, the link to that next event, which is perfect. Tell your friends to come out to these events. The conversation is different every time. The contributors are different every time. Um, the point, of course, is to have this communal conversation, right? And if we can't be in actual rooms, at least we can be in these virtual rooms. So um, yeah, so without further ado, I'll bring it back to Benjamin. Thank you so much, all of you. Matilda, thank you so much for this fantastic reading and discussion. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Um, please learn more about this incredible book and purchase Between Certain Death and a Possible Future at harvard.com. I'll put the link to purchase in the chat a couple of times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your week. Keep reading and stay safe, everyone. And check out Matilda's other events. They're amazing. Thank you, everyone. And don't forget to get your book from Harvard Bookstore. Mwah! Bye. Bye.